In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. We will study today chapter 5 from the Gospel of Saint Matthew. Let me give you introduction about this chapter. This chapter actually is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mountain. Sermon on the Mountain is recorded in three chapters, chapter 5 and chapter 6 and chapter 7 from the Gospel of Saint Matthew. The theme of the sermon is the Kingdom of Heaven. Kingdom of Heaven. So in this sermon, the Lord will start by the characteristics of those in the Kingdom those who will inherit and are living in the kingdom of heaven. And also he will discuss our relationship with the world. So, as the kingdom of heaven, uh, it is our home, our citizenship is heavenly. But here we are ambassadors in the world. So, what are the char our characteristics as heavenly living here on earth? And what's our relationship with others as ambassadors of Christ here. Uh, and the theme of the sermon, as I told you, Kingdom of Heaven, as it is clear from many verses, Matthew chapter 4, verse 17, Matthew chapter 5, verse 3, uh, verse 10, 19 and 20, Matthew chapter 6, verse 10, uh, and verse 33, Matthew, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. All these verses are about the kingdom of heaven. The characteristic of those in the kingdom of heaven are uh, explained in what we call it the Beatitudes. The Beatitudes describe the character and the blessedness of those who would be citizen of the kingdom. Beatitude means those who are blessed, because there are many, nine actually, blessedness. Blessed are those, blessed are those. So there are nine of them. And also, our relationship with the world was explained when the Lord said, you are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. So as ambassadors, here on earth, we are salt of the earth and light of the world. After this, actually, the Lord clarified his relationship with the law, law of Moses, because he was accused that he came to destroy the law. And his teaching was different than the teaching of the scribes and the Pharisees. So the Lord Jesus Christ actually explained that here he is not destroying the law but fulfilling the law and also he stressed that our righteousness should surpass the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees and I will explain this because the righteousness was based on the outward righteousness but our righteousness should start from within inward righteousness uh, rather than outward righteousness. And the Lord started to explain how he fulfilled the law by he made a series of contrast between the oral interpretation of the law and what he is expecting from us. When he said, you have heard that it was said to them, for example, thou shalt not murder, but I say to you. So here the Lord is explaining how he came to fulfill the law, and he is not expecting from, he is not expecting from us to keep the outward form of the law, but actually the spirit of the law and the inner meaning of the law. Uh, the Gospel of St. Matthew has five major homilies by the Lord Jesus Christ. Five major sermons. So the Sermon on the Mountain is the first. 
And as I told you, it takes three chapters, five, six, and seven. The second homily, when the Lord actually sent the disciple in Matthew chapter 10, from verse 5 to 11 verse 1. The third homily is the parables in Matthew chapter 13. The fourth homily about the church in Matthew chapter 18 verse 1 to 19 verse 1. And the uh, last homily, the eschatological homily about the end of the world from Matthew 24 verse 1 to 26 verse 1. And the word eschatology from uh, Greek word Eschatos means uttermost or end. Logos means word or discourse. So eschatology is the branch of theology about the end of the world. Eschatology about the end of the world. Uh, also, uh, how the Lord fulfilled the law. He said, you have heard that it was said, but I tell you. The law of Moses is considered the old covenant. God made a covenant with us. But this old covenant was made based on your work, your effort. There was no grace. But the new covenant actually is made on the grace, based on the grace of God. As we read in John chapter 1, the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth by Lord Jesus Christ. For example, in the old covenant, God gave us a commandment, love one another. But we don't have the grace to help me to forgive and to endure. That's why nobody was able to keep the law. But in the new covenant, God gave me the grace. So he did not give me only the commandment, but he gave me the power and the ability to fulfill the commandment. So the purpose of the law was actually to show me my weakness, to show me that I cannot uh, fulfill the law by my own effort. Like, you know, do you remember the miracle of catching many fish? How the, they tried all and labored all night, by, but they did not catch anything? So this was like the old covenant. We tried and tried and tried. But when Jesus came, you know, through his grace, they were able to catch many fish. So the law of Moses was like a tutor, a guide, to teach us about holiness and to prepare them for the coming of Messiah. So he taught us about holiness and righteousness, but he did not give me the ability to be righteous. Clear? He taught me about righteousness, but he did not give me the ability to uh, be righteous. Uh, but when Jesus came, he came with a new covenant. And actually, Jeremiah prophesied about this new covenant in Jeremiah chapter 31, from 31 to 34. And in Hebrew chapter 8, St. Paul quotes these verses from Jeremiah. Uh, and, and this uh, uh, new covenant is based on the grace. And God actually is giving us blessings and grace uh, in the new covenant. So the Sermon on the Mountain be begins with the introduction of this new law or new covenant the beatitude, the blessings of the new covenant, the grace of the new covenant that we received with the Messiah. So it is clear here that the Lord Jesus Christ in his ministry, his purpose is to do radical transformation of our hearts and our lives. Not transformation from outside, but radical transformation from within for our hearts and our lives. Uh, what are the sequence of events before the Sermon on the Mountain? 
if you read Luke chapter 6, you, you will find that the Lord actually spent the night in the mountain in prayer. Then in the morning, He chose the twelve disciples and appointed them. Then He came down to the plain with the twelve disciples. And He found a vast multitude. So he decided to teach them and to give them the Sermon on the Mountain. So he spent the whole night in prayer. Then he chose the twelve disciples. Then he descended with the disciples. And he found the multitude. And in order to teach them, so he ascended to the mountain. And the mountain is thought to be the horns of Hatin. This is about seven miles south, south of Capernaum, near the Sea of Galilee. Why he went up on the mountain? And actually, uh, this will make all the audience be able to listen him. So, uh, this actually will give, uh, will make the great gathering of people who came to listen to the Lord Jesus Christ, will be able to hear him better. Uh, and this was actually the usual pusher of the public teacher among the Jews. They sit on the mountain and then they speak to the people. So verse 1, And seeing the multitude, when he descended with the twelve disciples, he saw the multitude. He went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. His disciples, the twelve, came and sat around him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying. So he started to uh, preach to the multitude. And from verses 3, we will find nine verses. Each one starts by the word, the blessed. This is what we call it, the Beatitudes. So, each of the nine Beatitudes pronounces a blessing upon those who have certain characteristic. So, each characteristic deserves a blessedness. Blessedness more than happy. Happiness comes from earthly things, but blessedness comes from God. <coughs> That's why he did not say happy are, he said blessed. It is above and beyond just being happy. But this happiness or this blessedness is not bestowed randomly. There is a reason for each beatitude. For example, blessed are the poor, poor in spirit. So here this blessedness is given to those who are poor in spirit. But why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So, uh, let's uh, start this line Beatitudes one by one. Number one, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean poor in spirit? If I say you are poor in money, this means you don't have enough money. So, poor in spirit means you don't have enough righteousness, you don't have enough virtues. Maybe you are surprised that the Lord is saying, blessed are those who don't have enough virtues in their life, poor in, in, in righteousness. You know? Actually, yes, they are blessed. You know why? Because when they discover their poverty, then actually they will know they need God. But if they are blinded and feel they are not poor in spirit, they will never need God. Like when the disciples discovered that they are poor and they couldn't catch any fish, here only they realized their need to God. But if they trusted their ability and said, no, we are able to catch fish by ourselves, they will never go to God. Why the, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ was able 
to save the tax collectors, the adulterers, the thief on the cross. But the only group that was not saved by the Lord Jesus Christ is the scribes and the Pharisees, the religious leaders of Israel. Why? Because they never realized they were poor in spirit. They thought they are, not, they are rich in spirit. That's why they did not seek the Lord Jesus Christ. So the first step in the journey to the kingdom of heaven to discover that you are poor and to know that you, you, you cannot be righteous by yourself. This actually will be the first step in your journey to the kingdom of heaven. So poor in spirit, those who are deeply sensible of their spiritual poverty and wretchedness. And why they are blessed? Because they are just one step between them and the kingdom. What is this step to surrender to the Lord? To ask the Lord to come and help them. To tell him, I, I am nothing, but I need your help. I will put all my trust in you. And then you can actually give me the kingdom of heaven. And Christ did not come to call righteous. He said, I did not come to call righteous. Righteous those who feel in whom they are rich in spirit. But he came to call actually uh, the, 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 those who are poor in spirit. I did not come to call righteous, but I came to call sinners. The whole do not need a physician, but the sick. And, and what's his ministry? He came to preach repentance and actually to move people's heart to mourn over their sins. That's why what is the second blessing? What is the second beatitude? When I discover my poverty, I would be happy? No. I will develop godly sorrow. That's why the following blessing, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let me give you an example. Peter, before the crucifixion, he thought that he is rich in spirit. He told him, if everybody denied you, I will not deny you. I am rich in spirit. I am better than everybody else. But after he denied the Lord Jesus Christ three times, he discovered his poverty. He discovered that he is not better than the rest of the apostles. And when he discovered his poor in spirit, what did he do? He started to weep bitterly. That's why the second step, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Those who feel their spiritual poverty, actually they mourn after God. They mourn over their sins. They mourn because they are away from God. They mourn because their sins separated them, them from God. But there are two types of sorrow. You can read about these two types of sorrow in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. St. Paul said, Godly sorrow produces repentance, leads to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces death. We have Peter and Judas. Both of them became sorrowful. But Peter his sorrow was godly sorrow, led to repentance. But Judas, because he lost hope in God, so he went and killed himself. So the sorrow of the, sorrow of the world produces death like Judas Iscariot versus Peter or the prodigal son. When he discovered his poverty, he returned back to his father's house. And God actually is the comforter. As he said, blessed are those who mourn for they shall be comforted. In, in Matthew chapter 11 verse 28 to 30, he told us, come to me, you weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest, I will give you peace and comfort. 
We have the Holy Spirit, and one of the titles of the Holy Spirit is the Comforter. And the Holy Spirit will sustain us here. And also in heaven, God actually will wipe away every tear from our eyes. So comfort will be here and in the life to come. So the first two beatitude deal with how we see ourselves as poor and also we mourn over our sins, how we approach God. Then actually, a person who discovered his poverty and he start to mourn over his sin, do you think he will be arrogant? No, actually, he will be humble. He will be meek. That's why the third one, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. When I discover my poverty, I will not feel that I am better than others. So when I deal with others, I deal with them with meekness and with humbleness. So the third one is how to deal with others. What's meekness? Meekness is patience in reception of injuries. When I got hurt or injured, I will endure it with patience. It is gentleness. It is the opposite of sudden anger and malice. A meek person is opposite to those who are proud and arrogant. Meekness makes the person peaceful from within. And when I say meek or gentle, this doesn't mean we are weak. No, we are strong. Children of God are strong. That's why meekness and gentleness should not be mistaken with weakness. But what does it mean to inherit the earth? Usually people love the gentle and the meek. So these people will be loved with everybody. As if actually they inherited the whole earth. But actually... The word earth or land in, in the Old Testament, it was used by the prophet to refer to the promised land, land of Canaan. So when the Lord here, uh, he said they shall inherit the earth or they shall inherit the land, he's not speaking about here, but speaking about inheriting the promised land, the heavenly land. It is the, uh, the inheritance of the uh, kingdom of heaven. Kingdom of heaven. So, here we can say inherit the earth. It is reference to the Messiah's kingdom. And the promised land is just a symbol, a type of the kingdom of the Messiah. When I discover my poverty and when I mourn over my sin and acquire a gentle and meek heart, I will not be ashamed to ask for righteousness. The arrogant, they will not ask for anything because they believe that they can do it by themselves. It takes meekness to say, I'm hungry and thirsty. That's why the fourth beatitude, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Lord, I am poor. I have no righteousness, but I'm hungry and thirsty for your righteousness. And you will fill me. And actually, you will bestow upon me your own righteousness. Why the Lord used the word hunger and thirst? Because these two words are expressive of strong desire. My desire to his righteousness is very strong, like a hungry person or a thirsty person. Uh, so no word would better express this strong desire than the word hunger and thirst. Uh, 
and actually nothing uh, will 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 thirst will, will will quench this thirst or satisfy this hunger except the righteousness of God. But this righteousness uh, will be given to those who approach God. Righteousness means I will be cleansed from my sins. This righteousness. But in order actually to be cleansed from my sins and for God to have mercy upon me, I need also to forgive others their sins and their debts. That's why the following beatitude, blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. I cannot ask God to forgive me my sins and be merciful on me, while me myself, I don't forgive others and I'm not merciful over others. That's why we need to show mercy to others in order to get mercy from God and when we get mercy from God, He will give our sins and we will get His righteousness. So, merciful means those who instead of resenting injury, when somebody hurt me or injured me, I am ready to forgive. And because I am ready to forgive, I will, sh I will obtain the divine mercy and I will be forgiven and actually I will get the righteousness of God. And in the Lord's Prayer, the fifth petition in the Lord's Prayer, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. When we obtain the righteousness of God, then this righteousness is not external righteousness, but internal. So my heart will be clean, my heart will be pure, my heart will be righteous. That's why the following one, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And the word pure means those whose mind, motives and principles are pure. They don't have hidden agenda. Who seek not only to have external actions correct but who desire to be holy in heart we need actually to examine our motives our motives should be pure and clean and righteous because man as as we read in the uh, first samuel when samuel the prophet was choosing david the prophet God told him, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And those who are pure in heart, they shall see God. They shall see him with, not with these eyes in a physical way, but by spiritual vision, by faith. Because in the pure heart, the Lord will dwell and his presence will be recognized for they shall be for they shall see God and God actually is the king of peace so his children those who have God in their heart will be peacemaker like their heavenly father that's why the following beatitude verse 9 blessed are the peacemaker for they shall be called sons of God so the children of God in the name of, of the Lord, the Prince of Peace and the King of Peace, will go forth to proclaim peace and goodwill among men. Christ made peace. He was a peacemaker. Even, it's interesting, during the time of the trial, when Pilate sent Jesus to Herod, you read that there was enmity between Herod and Pilate. But since this time, they became friends. So even the Lord Jesus Christ was able to make peace between Pilate and Herod. Both of them judged him. And all those who promote peace and are peacemakers are like him. So they are worthy to be called his children, the children of God. 
When you acquire this righteousness, you know this righteousness is very valuable for you. That's why you will not compromise it for any reason. Even if you are persecuted, you will not compromise this righteousness. That's why the following one, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The first one, there's, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. That's the, the start of the journey to the kingdom of heaven. And this is the last one, the end of the journey toward the kingdom of heaven. You are now, in the first one, they are poor, they don't have righteousness. But the last one, they acquire this righteousness as free gift from God. And now after they get it, actually they will do, they will not compromise it at all. They will accept any suffering, any persecution. Because they know this righteousness will qualify them for the kingdom of heaven. That's why they will be persecuted. Uh, here the Lord did not, did not say, blessed are the persecuted for their misbehavior or misdeeds. But they are persecuted because of the righteousness. Because they are Christian. And, and God did not promise us that if we live faithfully and righteously, we will not suffer any troubles. Actually, he, he told us exactly the opposite. The road is narrow. And when we become righteous, we will face many suffering. So, uh, when we, we become true Christian, others will persecute us and they will revile us. But this we should accept it with joy because we will receive the blessedness of the kingdom of heaven. And if we are his children, as we read in verse 8, then he will defend us. We are his children. Uh, verse 9, called sons of God. So Christ will defend us. That's why verse 11, it's not considered a new beatitude, but it is a repetition of uh, uh, blessed are those who are persecuted. So the Lord said, blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. All kinds of evil falsely for my sake. Why you are blessed? Because these shall have the kingdom. Uh, I'm sure the martyrs, at the moment of their martyrdom, they remember these verses. Blessed are those, blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. And these words, I'm sure, supported and encouraged them during the time of martyrdom. Uh, what kingdom? For this is the kingdom of heaven. It is a spiritual kingdom. It is a kingdom of glory. It is the in eternal kingdom inheritance that will inherit after the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The way, uh, uh, when he said, and say all kinds of evil against you, means they will call you by evil and condescending names. They will mock you because you are Christian. So, the persecution mentioned in verse 10 and verse 11 comprehend all outward acts of violence against the Christian. All acts of violence against Christian. Uh, it, in, it include legal persecution, public accusation. Uh, and they did this with the Lord Jesus Christ himself. They called the Lord Jesus Christ. He was a Samaritan and had a devil in John chapter 8. And they said about him, he is out of his mind, he's crazy, he's mad in John chapter 10. And actually they reviled and mocked him on the cross as we read in Matthew chapter 27. But let us learn from the Lord Jesus Christ. 
when he was reviled, he did not revile again, as St. Peter told us. When they reviled him, he did not actually repay them by reviling. And also, when we are reviled, we should bless. As St. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 12, when we are reviled, we should bless. We should imitate his example and follow his role model and to be willing to suffer for his sake. The Lord in, in verse 12 told us, Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So this persecution started with the prophet and now continues with the Christian. And why we rejoice? Because of the reward. We will receive the crown of martyrdom. And it is said, the church father told us, the crown of the martyrdom is, uh, martyrdom is the brightest crown in heaven. So there is no other uh, uh, level higher than the martyrs. That's why many of the early Christians sought to become martyrs. And that's why they threw themselves in the way of their persecutor that they might be put to death and receive the crown of martyrdom. And that's what the, what the Lord said, great is your reward in heaven. When the Lord said they persecuted the prophets, yes, they persecuted the prophet. Isaiah, it is said to have been sought apart. Jeremiah was thrown into a dungeon and threatened with death. Elijah was hunted by Ahab and Jezebel. So they persecuted 